like our family lineage. Really? Back in the day, you used to make beer koozies, and I find it hard to believe just because like that can't be, that has to be like a recent invention. I don't know. Koozie? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know what I mean? Makes sense. So, but they used to call koozies boozes. So I guess when we met, I don't know. But that's like all I was told. Uh, that makes sense. It's like your occupation. Right. Your yeah. boozer. That's what my grandfather had to say, but um, I feel like there's probably like a deeper meaning behind it. One time I Googled like, I was on some website and it was like, the meaning behind your last name. And they didn't even have an answer for it. Like the website. could be like a shortened version of something. Right. Yeah. Like, 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 like over time. to America, it's like they change, they cut off the long part. Right. So that way it's more American. Exactly. Like, Easier to pronounce. You can blend in and not, people won't think like, oh, this person's from Europe. Right. You know. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's funny though, because almost everywhere I go, people are like, is that how you pronounce that? Booze? I'm like, yeah, that's how, I, that's how you pronounce it. And they're like, oh. You, you must have had so much fun in college. <laughs> I'm like, no, not really. I went to community college. Like, fun in college and fun on Halloween. Yeah, right? Boo. <laughs> yeah. With Sean's here. Is he going to boo us? Yeah. Um, whatever. <laughs> but cool. Yeah, welcome. What were you up to early for today? Not much. Um, today I had the day off. So I woke up, got some breakfast at Ethan Rest. Okay. Took a shower and headed here. Nice. Yeah. Well, welcome to my house. Yeah, it's a beautiful house. Thank you. All right, well, let's get started. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Nashville Artist. I'm Jordan, and today Sean Booz is here. Well, Hello, everyone. Welcome. So where are you from? Um, I grew up in Donaldson, oh. like Hermitage, Donaldson area. My mom grew up in Nashville, but I don't know. She moved east the older she got. So like when she was my age and first moved out, she moved to like Donaldson, Hermitage, had me. And then we moved to Mount Juliet, and then Lebanon when I was in high school. So I went to Wilson Central High School, graduated from there, and then when I was 19, I moved to East Nashville. Okay. And how old are you now? 24. Okay. Nice. And you, so you've lived all over. Yeah. Yeah, basically. What is your favorite part of Nashville? Right now, West Nashville. That's where I live. Um, I moved out West like last year. I don't know. A lot of my friends live there. It seems like more of like a family neighborhood yeah. type of vibe. Um, it's cheaper. We have a two-story house now, and we pay as much for that as we did out here for just like a one-story, two-bedroom house. So I don't know. Yeah, West is nice. There's that little strip on Charlotte with all the antique shops and Richland Park and stuff. Wow. It's very cool. How many people live at your house? So myself, my friend Eli, and my friend Robbie. Oh. Yeah, we're all in Linwood together. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. That makes band practice easy. Super easy, yeah. Every Thursday and Sunday, we just, like, go downstairs. Really? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so downstairs is, like, the music layer? Yeah, I have my drum set down there. We have, like, all of our amps and our stacks. Um, We have, like, a 48-channel mixing board down there, too. So Wow. Yeah, a whole bunch of stuff. Do recording? Yeah, yeah. We actually just recorded an EP in April with our friend Sam Winnegar, and we released it, like... Late June, I want to say like June 24th. Okay, cool. Yeah, we recorded all of it at the house. Awesome. Yeah. So, do you have any siblings? I have a half sister. When I was eight years old, my mom remarried to this guy, and he had two kids already. So, I had stepbrothers for a period of time, and then my mom and that guy had my little sister, Mackenzie. And then they ended up getting a divorce, so I don't have the stepbrothers anymore, but um, still have Mackenzie. She's awesome. I love her. She's about to turn 16. Oh. Yeah. So, it, I don't know. It's, it's weird watching your siblings grow up and, like, yeah. go through the phases that you went through. Yeah, especially if you're the older one. Yeah. And for so long, I was, like, either an only child, and then when my mom got remarried, I was kind of, like, the middle child. But, yeah, I'm definitely stepping into my older brother role. Nice. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I grew I was the youngest, so... I was always looking up. Right. <laughs> Never looked down. It's different, for sure. Yeah, you have to, like, pass on knowledge and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to kind of be an example. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Which can be hard when you don't even have your life figured out. But, right. But, you know, who does? Right. So what were you into as, like, a little kid? Music, video stuff. I've kind of kept the same interests my entire life, but... um. 
Yeah, like my first favorite band was Green Day when I was like six years old. Like I got the um, International Super Hits record oh, yeah. that had like all the singles from the first three albums. So that was like in rotation a lot. My early years, um, I used to make like stop motion videos on like an old camcorder with my uh, childhood best friend Kevin. We'd just like use our action figures and do that. So I don't know, like video and music stuff has always been like a uh, like a common thread. Really? Mm -hmm. Like when it? How old were you when you first started messing with video? Like when we were doing the stop motion stuff, my friend Kevin and I, we were around the same age, like six, seven. Wow. Yeah, like very young. He was a year or two older than me and kind of got me into a lot of like cool stuff at an early age. Like he was the first person to show me the Beatles, the Sex Pistols. It's kind of like an older brother. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. And he, uh, he ended up going to Watkins before Watkins got absorbed by Belmont. And I don't know, he was just always into film. And he, like later when we got older, he was like, who got me into like the French New Wave and like film periods like that. Wow. Just like artsy stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah. What kind of action figures would you all be playing stop motion with? Oh man, just like the main ones. I don't know, we had like Spider-Man and Batman and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I was huge into action figures when I was a little kid. I always dreamed of making a stop motion video. Yeah, it was around the same time like YouTube first came out, like 2005, 2006, whenever it was. And um, our biggest aspiration was just to get on YouTube. And it's funny like, growing up and realizing how easy that it is. But back then it was just like cloud and a mystery. We had no idea. Right. Yeah. Wow. Did, are any of your stop motion videos on YouTube now? No, which I'm really upset about. So we recorded everything on like a camcorder that took VHS tapes. Uh, so back in the day, you know, we had like a converter where you could put the VHS tape in another tape and like be able to play it like on a TV or whatever. But I don't, we lost all the tapes. I don't even have the camera that we used anymore. But I think back on it, I'm like, man, yeah. it would be so cool to like see what we were up to at that age creatively. Because right. I have like vague memories of, you know, because we would write scripts and have like a whole like storyboard. You know, Sick. we were really into it, but um, we also like, I don't know, we made comics too. Wow. Yeah, we were we were two very creative kids back in the day. And did you do a lot of it. drawing? I did, yeah, a lot of drawing. That didn't really stick with me. The first thing I wanted to be when I like grew up as a kid uh, was an artist. Like when people would ask, I'd be like an artist, and I was like into the visual thing and into painting and drawing and all that, but. Somewhere along the way, I just, like, music took over, I guess. Nice. What first got you into music? You said Green Day. Green Day was definitely, like, one of the first bands. I'm trying to think exactly what ignited it. In middle school, I was listening to a lot of, like, metalcore music. So, like, the Warp Tour scene, Asking Alexandria, kind of those bands. And the summer before high school, me and my friend went to Warp Tour. My mom drove us to Atlanta. And I remember on the like the day we were like heading up there, my friend Sydney and I were like, we should start a band. And I got like really into it. And she was like, I'll play guitar and you play drums. And, you know, we were like 12 at the time. I was like, hell yeah, let's do that. And I remember asking my mom to, you know, like sign me up for drum lessons, like on the way to Warp Tour. And uh, by the time we got back to Tennessee, she had it all like scheduled out. And I went to a drum lesson and I was hooked ever since. Nice. Yeah. Where did you take drum lessons? I took from a few different people starting out. My first drum teacher was actually one of my mom's old boyfriends who like, they kept in touch, more like still friendly. His name was Randall. I took like two lessons with him. He was like into ACDC and like Ozzy Osbourne and stuff like that. So like he tried to teach me like Crazy Train. I remember that was like the first song. And then I started taking from this guy, Graham. I wish I would remember Graham's last name because he's still in East Nashville and I see him every so often. He was a really good teacher. He um, did like drumline in college. And around that time when I was like 12, 13, I also wanted to do drumline stuff. Mm -hmm. So we went all over a lot of like the rudiments and just like reading music and stuff. Who were some of your drumming heroes like at that time? Who were you like, this person's a badass. I'm gonna be like that. At the time, Probably Dave Grohl. I was huge into Nirvana. Any drummers from that kind of like metalcore warp tour scene? 
like the drummer from A Day to Remember I really liked. I don't remember his name, but um, Dave Grohl mostly, I would say. A lot of Nirvana. A lot of Nirvana, Foo Fighters too, mm-hmm. you know. Queens of the Stone Age. I never really got into them. Dave Grohl is a drummer. Yeah, yeah, they were like a super group. I remember yeah. that whole thing, but yeah, I never got into them. Wow. What about Trey Cool? Oh, yeah, of course. Of course, Trey Cool. How could I forget? Yeah, he plays so fast, too. And um, the band I play in right now called Impediment, we play very fast. And sometimes I I, uh, channel that Trey Cool energy. Yeah. Yeah, Crazy 16th note fills and stuff. Right. But he keeps it simple, though. He doesn't Mm -hmm. overcomplicate it. Yeah. Just, like, right in the pocket. Right. Like, he's like the Phil Rudd of punk. Literally. Because Phil Rudd was very, I'll hold it down, do something, then go back to holding it down. Yeah, honestly, kind of my favorite drum style, you know, because yeah. it lets the other instruments breathe. Right, right. Yeah, there's, there's, I've come to appreciate all the different, you know, this person's a pocket drummer, this person's a textural drummer, this person's more staccato, this right. drummer's more reverberant. Mm-hmm. Like... Because some people, like, right now, like to dampen every drum down to where it's just a thud. And that's a whole style. Right, yeah. And then there's the whole John Bonham, everything's wide open. It's nice to be aware of the different styles, so you can pick and choose which um, you want to work on, or, I don't know, what band and context, like, like it's a style is called for. Right. You know, like some some bands want you to be all over the place playing fills, you know, every measure, and some bands don't want any fills. Right. Yeah, it's nice to know instead of trying to be everything at once. Exactly. You kind of fill out, all right, this is the type of music. um, You kind of find where it's appropriate for you to do your thing. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, drums were your first instrument? Yes. Yeah, I started playing drums. 2012, I would say. 2012, okay, yeah. cool. Did you like, play in school or anything like that, like in middle school or high school? Yeah, so I didn't play in middle school, but I played in high school. I started playing drums seriously, like I said, like summer before freshman year is when I first started taking lessons. And then freshman year really got into like rudiments and how to move around the kit and stuff like that. But all I had was an electric kit. And I remember my mom sat me down and she was like, if you join Drumline, I'll buy you a drum set. And I kind of had a bias. I was like, oh, Drumline's a part of the band and band's geeky and I don't want to be a geek, you know. Um, But the ultimatum of buying me a drum set was enough. And she was like, you only have to do it for a year. If you don't like it, you can stop. And I was like, okay. So I, uh, you know, went to tryouts, got in and started talking with the Drumline kids, became very fast friends with them. And... um, just did it all throughout high school after that, sophomore through senior year. Nice. Yeah. Um, I played, the first year I played in the pit, um, which isn't actually on the marching field. It's kind of at the front. That's like where the marimbas and the vibraphones and chimes and stuff are. And I played timpani my very first year, which was fun. And then my junior and senior year, I played um, quads, like cool. tenors. Nice. Mm-hmm. And then all between that, just playing drum set at home? Yeah, playing drum set at home. Um, my high school room was, like, full of just, like, Nirvana posters. And I remember, like, my drum set was in my room, and I would just, like, stare at, like, Dave Grohl and, like, <laughs> Kurt Cobain and Chris Novoselic and be like, one day, you know, I'm going to be in a band like Nirvana. But, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a lot of just drumline and, like, a concert band and stuff like that in high school. And then I started playing in bands really like right after high school when I moved to Nashville. Okay. Yeah. But there was no like one band in Nashville that you like played with all throughout? Or? No, not really. I mean, it was my dream to play in band in high school, but it just never really worked out because I grew up Mount Juliet, Lebanon area. And um, yeah, there just weren't many musicians, which is funny to think because you come to Nashville and everyone plays music, you know? Right. So that uh, boonies, no. Yeah, literally nobody. But uh, yeah, I would say like 2017, the year after I graduated high school, moving to Nashville, just starting bands, all of them, you know, fell through. But it was nice to get that experience. Nice. Mm-hmm. What uh, like, what kind of experience did you play out at all? 
No, I would say the first time I played out officially was like 2018, 2019-ish. At the early stage, like 2016, 2017, I mean, there were just a lot of punk bands that me and my friend Eli were in and were trying to start. Eli and I have been friends since high school. He was actually in Drumline with me, and we play in Linwood together now. But, um, yeah, back in the day, we were in a few bands, just like, I don't know, like I said, just punk bands that fell through. What, uh, was your mom musical? Not really. She showed me some music growing up. Like, she showed me Green Day, she showed me Korn, trying to think. She showed me Foo Fighters, like, early memories when I was a kid. I remember, like, her just blasting that in the car. Same with my dad. He wasn't very musical, but showed me some cool stuff. Um, he was really big into Motley Crue. <laughs> so he showed me Motley Crue. I've seen them live, like, four or five times. But, um... No one kind of in my immediate family played music besides my grandfather on my dad's side. He was also a drummer. But the last time he played drums was actually at his wedding when he married my grandmother. (laughs) It was the last time ever. Wow. So, I mean, that was probably early 70s, late 60s, something like that. But him and I talk about it every so often because he played out kind of when like doo-wop was a big thing and um, when rock and roll first started. 60s. So, yeah, exactly. Like early 60s. And um, I don't know. It, it's cool. It's like a touchstone for the past when him and I have conversations. And he talks about like the dance halls and how it was back then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then I fill him in on like how it is now and, you know, the punk scene here and stuff. And I just say the Motown beat's gotten faster. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because uh, lately I've been listening to a ton of ministry. Okay. I'm huge. I'm. In the past six months, they've become one of my favorite bands, which is kind of wild. Nice. They just played here, right? Yeah, I saw them. It was awesome. Hell yeah. And in one of their songs called Burning Inside, during the chorus, it's just a straight up Motown beat, just faster. Hell yeah. And it's just like, that's awesome. Like, that's the way it is now. It's like, mm-hmm. That beat has evolved to now become a heavy part of music. Right. It's interesting. Um, there's only so many beats and it's weird to see them uh transform over time right yeah like drum and bass just right like funk just sped up mm-hmm. really fast yeah 160 bpm you know that's yeah. the drum and bass tempo it's crazy the world we live in now because there is no real genre now it's so blended so there's so many sub genres of genres of genres that like there's not really that many like straight up this is pop Right. This is rock. I think that's exciting. I know. We live in the golden time of music where everything is just such a melting pot so fast. Mm -hmm. Because, like, back probably the the last period, last time we had set genres was probably the 90s or the 2000s. Totally. Now it's, I mean, maybe when we had indie rock, that was new at one point. Mm hmm. Now it's like that's mixed in with so much other stuff. So much other stuff, and the internet plays a huge part in that for sure. Just being able to tap into, I don't know, at least for me, YouTube has been such a resource because, you know, any genre or any like subgenre, there's like a vast just like YouTube niche for it. Okay. I got really into like 90s screamo and 90s post hardcore two summers ago, and there's just like so many YouTube channels dedicated to such a niche genre and you find so many bands. And I'm sure it's like that for every genre, you know? Oh yeah, man. I love YouTube. That's the, my favorite greatest technological advance since probably like 2003. Yeah. Whatever. It's been my favorite more so than the cell phone. I mean, it's like YouTube is amazing. Yeah. I remember when I was in sixth grade going on YouTube to look at, I was, for some reason, I was really into Queen and like really into Another One Bites the Dust. Okay. And I'd watch that video all the time. And when I was in sixth grade, I had like a little tape recorder, except it was digital. It was more advanced. Okay. And I would record that and then just listen to it at school or the recording because I didn't have like a CD player or anything like that. But right, you're just ripping it. Yeah, right from YouTube. YouTube, watching YouTube videos and. Like in seventh grade, watching like Guns N' Roses, and they play these massive ass stadiums. Which is, oh my god! Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's cool that you're able to see that, right? Like on YouTube. Um, you can go to any time period. Yeah, exactly. And you don't have to be there. Um, and that's a very recent advancement in human history. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's a particular time period we're living through, for sure. And the fact that we can learn anything we want to. Yeah. Any drum, like any video, any, we can, that's why people so much younger than us are getting so good so fast. I know. It's almost scary, but it's yeah. exciting at the same time. I mean, the innovation is just so fast. Yeah. I also, going back to like the genre thing where like there isn't many uh, people like doing one genre, it's usually like a mixed bag of genres now. I really like that, like genre bending. Some yeah. of my favorite bands are like the genre bending bands right. who aren't afraid to be like, oh yeah, I play punk music, but I love Ariana Grande. Right. You know, like incorporating multiple styles that you wouldn't think work together, but then when you hear it, you're like, oh, this was made to work together. Right. Yeah. I think. In our day and age, I'm not a huge fan of this band, but I think King Gizzard is the one that's doing that right now. Big time. They got yeah. like a pop thing and they got their metal thing. Right. I never right. got into them either, but they definitely seem like one of the bigger bands. They're that's just experimental. They tread the silly line for me. It's it's just a little bit too silly for me. Sometimes. Yeah. Like when something goes too psychedelic, it becomes silly almost. For sure. And then I kind of like lose interest. I don't know. I never got too big into like those type of psychedelic bands like Tame Impala, King Gizzard. Right. I'm sure there's a few that I'm missing, but I just like kind of like the skipped OCs. the OCs. I okay, so I actually really they got always the do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. They have that same little screen. King Gizzard does yeah. the same thing. Mm -hmm. I did though get into Ty Siegel and that oh, kind of yeah. like garage rock scene that happened um, in like the mid 2010s. Oh, I yeah. really liked that stuff. Yeah, Ty Siegel. Yeah, house. Okay, cool. So, what do you call yourself like a videographer? Is that what that is? As far as the video stuff, I don't know what I would like call myself. Videographer, probably. I have a pretty nice video camera. I wish I could remember the exact name. It's like a Panasonic something or another, like ABX, followed by a few numbers. I don't know exactly exactly what the camera is. But I'll bring that to shows and I'll tape shows. I haven't done much directing, but I just directed like a little music video for my solo project um, with my girlfriend Grace Hall. And that was really fun. I do like video flyers for bands in town. Um, but a lot of that has been kind of a recent development for me. I'm really into like analog video gear. So I have a video channel mixer at the house with like Basically, the, the easiest way to explain it is it has an A bus and a B bus, and you can plug in two inputs and then mix them together. So you can do like chroma key stuff, um, picture in picture, just a lot of like practical analog video effects. Mm. But all of it's super expensive because they don't make it anymore. So that video mixer I got was like $800. Damn. And then I have a few video synths, and each of those are like $300, $400. And you have to have a computer with, you know, video software, which is, you know, depending on which software you pick, that can be a hundred to five hundred dollars. It's all very costly. Um, and I've had my eye on it for a while, probably like 2015, 2016 is when I was like, oh, analog video gear is the way to go. At least for me, that's like what I was interested in, but didn't have the financial um, foundation to get into it. But last year I started managing at the Urban Juicer. And I'm making a lot more money that I than I was, so I was like, might as well spend this money on something I've wanted to do for so long. Nice. Yeah. So I'd say like last November is when I kind of got all the gear. I don't know. I'm at a spot now where I'm just like pumping out video flyers, and like I said, we just did that music video, Grace and I, and a lot of people are noticing like, oh hey, he's good at this thing. Yeah. I like yeah. The video flyers, and I. Really like the uh, cell tower video with Grace. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of people have been really supportive about it, and um, you know I've gotten a lot of commissions for more video flyers, and yeah, I'm just excited to get better at it, and you know probably buy more gear and spend more money. Right. <laughs> right it is. Yeah. Build the little collection. Exactly. I mean, it's all going to be used, so it's not like it's a statue you're buying. Yeah, and it's an investment, you know. Yeah. And. Eventually, I want to make music videos for other people aside from myself as well. So, I don't know. There, there's potential to make it profitable. 
why are you uh, why are you into the video stuff? I don't know. There, it's it's a very specific medium, video, and just like movies in general. It like combines all the art forms. I feel like visual, auditory, you know, storytelling. It has kind of everything all in one, and it's very new as well. And I don't know. My personal opinion is that like most movies feel the same, especially in America. It's like okay, linear plot rise and fall, climax, those kind of things. And I love a good storyteller, so I'm not shitting on that format, but I feel like, I don't know. There's other textures and um, symbols and visuals that aren't being used in cinematography and videography right now that I'm excited to kind of tap into, um, especially with like internal video feedback, video synthesis, stuff like that. Eventually, I want to incorporate those textures into more of like a movie type thing and less of just a video flyer or music video, more of like a big statement. Right. Mm -hmm. Short film or even a big Yeah, exactly. Probably start out with like a 20, 25 minute short film. But yeah, all that's very new for me. And like, like I said, I've always been interested in it, but right now is the first time in my life where I'm actually doing something with that interest, um, investing in it. I don't know. I'm excited. Who uh, who are some of your favorite directors? Maybe who are some of your favorite films? I have a lot. Top five, top ten. Yeah, so I would say my favorite directors, definitely David Lynch. I pull a lot of inspiration just not even with his, like, movies, but everything he does. You know, he's a visual artist. He's a musician. And just the way he talks about art and life, I find really inspiring. I love Stanley Kubrick, you know, Jean-Luc Godard from um, the French New Wave. He's great. Francois Truffaut from the French New Wave. I'm trying to think of at least one more, because that's four. Paul Wes Anderson. Or uh, <laughs> I just combined two directors' names. Paul Thomas Anderson. Paul Thomas Anderson. You know, Wes Anderson's cool too. But yeah, Paul Thomas Anderson for sure is a favorite. Oh yeah. What's your favorite Wes Anderson movie? I don't know. That's a good, that's a that's a good question. He has so many. Probably like Mount Rushmore or what's that? Uh, Grand Budapest Hotel was really good. My favorite is Bottle Rocket. That's first, a good, the very first, first one. one. Yeah, first, yeah, yeah. That's Luke Wilson and Owen's Wilson's first movie. Yeah, their debut. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it's in black and white as well, right? No, it's no? in color. Okay, cool. That movie's so damn funny. Yeah, I've only seen it once, and it was a while ago, but Owen Wilson's character Dignan is uh -huh. so good. It's kind of like a heist movie, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. But they're all really kind of silly and uh -huh. not very serious. Totally. That's hilarious. Nice. Okay, cool. And then, so, those are your favorite, some of your favorite directors. What are some of your favorite movies? The 500 Blows by Francois Truffaut is really good. It's a French New Wave movie. came out in, I want to say, the 50s or 60s. Probably the 60s. And um, follows this little boy, Anton, and he's probably 11 or 12, and it's just like a coming-of-age movie. Very good, a lot of really good shots. It's shot in black and white. Just a beautiful movie. Nice. Mm -hmm. He, like, I think tries to run away from home. I don't want to spoil too much, but, yeah, it's a coming-of-age movie. Oh, that's cool. What, else, what other movies? Mulholland Drive by David Lynch, oh, for sure. I remember the first time I watched that, it was a big experience for me like afterwards I was like I have to make something on this level you know what a grand statement Mulholland Drive is um, makes your skin crawl oh for sure there's some very uncomfortable scenes Jesus. in that movie but uh, you know that's that's David Lynch for you yeah. the dark is what's exciting exactly right there's something beautiful in the macabre but I also really like Eraserhead anything from David Lynch was probably in my like top favorite movies 2001 A Space Odyssey, <laughs> you know, really love that movie and just like how innovative, in, innovative it was at the time, just with like with the props and stuff like that. It's just so beautiful. So I think if there's anything else I should mention favorite movie wise, 
Pierre Lefou by Godard is another really good movie in the French New Wave canon. Okay. Yeah. Anything by Godard, too, I love. His first movie, Breathless, is really good. I would say that's the most widely known by him. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. And you, I think you've already answered this, but like, how did you get into video? You were just doing it as so much as a little kid that it just kind of... Yeah, so I did it a lot as a little kid, and my childhood friend Kevin, like I said earlier, he was really into video stuff, and he showed me a lot of movies growing up. Like, he was the first one to show me Gremlins, Star Wars, like all of the classic cool movies. And him and I would make stop motion together. So the interest was there kind of from the get-go. And then sometime during high school, when I was like 15 or 16, I watched like every movie by Stanley Kubrick, got really into him. The Shining, I should have mentioned earlier as one of my favorite movies. Absolutely love that movie. Yeah, and it was it was very just, it was much more of an interest than a hobby. And then like I said, I came into some money because I manage the Urban Juicer now. And finally bought a lot of video gear that I had wanted for a long time. So that's how I got into it, yeah. Nice. Okay, cool. I already asked you why you're drawn to video. Why are you drawn to music? Oof. I feel like music is the best way to describe like nonverbal emotions. Or I, I don't know. Maybe that wasn't the best way to put it because all emotions are kind of nonverbal. But uh, it's the best way to express something that can't be said, I feel. It's also a very uh, immediate medium, whereas like I feel like with visual art and movies and most other art forms, you kind of have to think about it to understand the overall meaning, whereas music, you don't have to intellectualize it as much. It's kind of more of a visceral thing that when you hear it, you feel something. You don't have to like deconstruct the sound to feel something. Right. Whereas like... You know, abstract art is kind of the only exception because you look at abstract art and you can kind of feel something immediately. But uh, classical art and, you know, almost every movie, you kind of have to, like, intellectualize and think about before you get, like, a, a overwhelming feeling. A visceral kind of reaction. Exactly. Yeah, so that's definitely why I'm drawn to music. I don't know. It's just, like, kind of always what I've done, always what I've liked, too. So I know no other way. How do you develop your music skills? So, like I said, I was in drumline in high school and learned a lot of rudiments and foundational stuff. We always played with the metronome. So that helped me out a lot. Now, I, I, I still do a lot of those warm-ups that we used to do in drumline. When I like first sit down at the drum set, I'll start doing paradiddles and um, you know double stroke rolls and stuff like that. I'm a really big uh, proponent of taking lessons as well. So I took drum lessons until I was 17, like 12 to 17. And I felt like I got to a point where I really didn't need it anymore. Um, but when I was 19, I started taking guitar lessons. And that's something that I still do to this day. Usually every Monday, I go to this uh, guy's house. His name is Dave. And he's super cool. He's really into like jazz fusion stuff and um, I don't know, we like read jazz standards and deconstruct the harmony and like think about it. And yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm very much into practicing and developing my chops. I feel like you, a lot of people who grew up listening to punk or rock or whatever kind of have a dogma where it's like, oh, I don't need to practice my scales or, oh, I don't need to practice with the metronome because that's not what so-and-so did or, you know, and it's just like, oh man, you're cutting yourself short because... If you got your chops up a little bit, you would be able to go more places musically. And you can still play punk, you know what I mean? The reason why I can play so fast as a drummer is because I played with a metronome, you yeah. know? And now every punk band I play in, they're like, oh my God, you're so good. You can play fast. I'm like, yeah, well, it's actually not that hard if you just yeah. devote some time and energy to it, really. So, yeah, I don't know. I like practicing and moving forward with anything in life. Right. Yeah, you gotta feel that you're making progress. Yeah, and it's also just, what a source of meaning when you can watch yourself grow. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're like you're like a video game character getting more skills. Literally. Yeah, it feels good. Oh yeah. What uh? So you played 
drums, guitar, bass, you sing? Yeah, yeah, a little bit of everything. So um, I'm just now getting my solo project off the ground that's been in the works for like three years now. Um, it's called Cell Tower, and I write and perform everything in that. Um, trying to get a live band together. I have a few people that uh, have reached out. I'm looking to have like the first live show by the end of this year. Really excited for that. But um, yeah, when I record stuff for Cell Tower, I play guitar, bass, drums, vocals, the whole thing. Nice. Yeah. Who are some of your favorite guitar players? That is a good question. Uh, so this band Women from Canada, I believe it was like Calgary they were based out of. They were kind of like an early 2010s band. One of their members died and they broke up. And some of the members went on to start the band um, Preoccupations, who are still around right now. And then one of the people, he was like the other guitar player who did not die. His name is Patrick. I don't remember his last name. But his style of guitar playing is really cool. I really look up to that. It's kind of angular, not many chords, more like melody based guitar playing. I like. Sides from women in that angular style of guitar. I'm trying to think. Um, Kevin Shields from My Bloody Valentine. Oh, yeah. Thinking about the guitar as more of like an atmospheric thing rather than a songwriting tool or like structural harmony tool. I like a lot. Just like, like walls of sound. Exactly. I like thinking about it more as a noise machine sometimes. And he developed that way of thinking about the guitar really well, I think. Like him and like Thurston Moore of Sonic Youth both oh, yeah. are in that like ballpark of experimental guitar work. You know. What about singers? Kevin Shields as well. Um, Belinda Butcher and My Bloody Valentine. Like I'm definitely pulling from the shoegaze scene from the 90s um, for my solo project and like my vocal approach is definitely ripping off of Kevin Shields, Belinda Butcher, kind of, oh also I should mention uh, Michael Stipe from R.E.M. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. His vocal style and the way he approaches melody is a huge influence. Drawn out notes, right? not many runs. Um, here in Nashville everyone's extremely talented and I don't know, I have a lot of friends that are in bands and it's not a bad thing to be a good singer and do runs and go all over the place. But for me, I really like long, drawn out notes and like a melody that's like three or four notes, but it takes up like 16 bars. You know, I feel like Michael Stipe is really good at that. I'm trying to think there's probably another person out there that has that same vocal approach. Patti Smith, lyrically for me, was a huge inspiration and still is. Absolutely love her and her, obviously her music, but her books as well. Huge inspiration for me. Okay, awesome. And how do you develop your video skills? That's a good question. I'm still trying to figure that out. Right now, it's a lot of experimentation. Like when I get asked to do a flyer, no one really gives me much aesthetic advice. They're like, okay, this is where the show is going to be, the time, this is how much it's going to cost, and these are the bands. And they're like, have fun with it. So I just like kind of experiment around until I get something I'm satisfied with, but there's not much practicing that goes into it. Whereas music, it's definitely like an everyday thing that it's like I'm trying to create this craft around. Whereas video, it's much more of like a throw everything on the canvas and see what sticks kind of thing. But I don't know, I'm still developing kind of that modality for myself. I see. Yeah. Okay. Of all time, what are some of your favorite bands and artists? First one that comes to mind is this band from the 90s um, called Seisha. How do you spell that? S-A-E-T-I-A. They're a screamo band from New York. They just actually got back together, and they're going to be playing a few shows in November, which is very crazy and historic. Basically, everyone in the screamo community is freaking out that they're coming back together because they haven't played a show in like 30 years. And when they were a band, they were kind of not very well known. So I'd say like the most they've ever played to is like 50 people. And the shows that they're playing in New York um, sold out in minutes. And there's gonna be like 300, 500 people there. So it's definitely, I don't know, a good time for the Screamo community in regards to that. So Seisha is definitely a big band for me. We mentioned Green Day earlier. 
you know that's just been like my favorite band since i was like six or seven my blade valentine for sure there's a lot of really good contemporary shoegaze going on right now that i'm like kind of obsessing over currently hotline tnt wednesday they are getting a body of water you know Wait. there's Hotline TNT, and then what was the other one? Uh, this band, Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, and then there's another one called They Are Gutting a Body of Water. Those are like the three big ones in this scene right now that most people know. But there's a lot of other ones that are really good. Oh, man. But of all time, I don't know. There's just so many bands. These are the shoegaze bands? Yeah, yeah these are the shoegaze bands that are like current. Like, I don't know. I call it 20s shoegaze as opposed to 90s shoegaze. Right. You know, so... That's kind of the stuff I'm currently obsessing over. I'm trying to think who else I should mention. Yeah, I don't know. That's one of the questions where like I get asked and so many bands come to mind that I just kind of start rambling. <laughs> but I don't really know. They're so, great. So we covered some of your favorite bands and artists. What kind of musician are you? Uh, in the context of genre or just like I guess generally? drummer guitarist oh okay singer. i don't know it, it's hard to identify with one instrument i've been playing drums the longest for 10 years from what you told me punk fast yeah fast punk stuff like rudiments. that rudiments a passionate musician like i feel like when i play live i just i tap into like almost a meditative state but i don't really think about it in the moment but i kind of go off especially on drums and then, you know, after the show, when I see videos, when my friends come up to me, they're like, oh my God, you're a monster, you're crazy, you're this, you're that. Then I look at videos and I'm like almost scared because I'm like going so fast and I look so like into it and like, I don't know, almost angry, but not angry, but like I'm playing so fast and trying to like hold on that my, like the facial expressions I make are just funny. Right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, definitely a passionate player. Awesome. Yeah. What, um... But you would say, like, uh, drumming-wise, very much punk-heavily influenced. Punk, fast. screamo, post-hardcore. Another band I should have mentioned with that last question is Fugazi. I think Fugazi is probably one of the biggest bands for me, uh, stylistically, when it, especially when it comes to drums. Because just classic punk is fun. Like, we were talking about Trey Cool. He holds it down. He's super fast. And that style is fun. But I also like to, I don't know do interesting things I don't, I don't want to get caught up in drummer talk i was going to say like 16th notes on the hi-hat and then going around the kit but not everyone's going to know what i That's mean fine. you know what i mean but like you know just like kind of fancy stuff but not too fancy i feel like fugazi is a good like example of that drumming style okay you don't like delve into the odd time signatures or yeah i do actually you know like four four is great six a is great but um a lot of the bands in the 90s that I like, Fugazi too, use a lot of 5-4, 7-4, stuff like that. I honestly think 5-4 is one of the best time signatures. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can do so much with it. And you can be simple when it sounds interesting, Right. which is nice. Yeah, I like 5-4. We have a song in 5. It goes from 4-6 to 5-6 to 5-6. That's another thing that's really cool, um, is combining time signatures oh, like that as a phrase. Making them, yeah, like, like elongating them. That's the coolest shit. Because then um, it's like when you listen to it, you're like, we're in 5 right now, but then we go into 6. But does that mean we're in 11? Yeah, right? It's hard to actually keep track of. Linwood, one of the bands I'm in, we do a lot of that. Where it's like a measure of 5-4, then 4-4, then 5-4. We just like trade off, which is really cool. Awesome. Okay, and you said you're still kind of figuring it out, but what kind of videographer, movie maker are you? Experimental, for sure. Just because there isn't a lot of, I don't know, like I said, I don't have a modality yet that I can just tap into or practice with. Like your shtick. Yeah, exactly, like my MO. I don't really have one when it comes to videography. I kind of just sit down at the computer with all my gear and just find what works. You know, I just, I have a capture card because with all this analog gear, you have to convert it digitally. So I'll get all the connections set up with my analog gear and then connect it to the capture card and then pull up my video software program and uh, just experiment around, you know, see what looks cool. 
it's usually like it doesn't take that much like i don't know like i just made a video flyer for a show that's happening today at two boots molly martin heaven honey and abby johnson are playing oh yeah i saw that yeah and that everyone when i like sent it to to go records they were like this is sick and when they post everyone like this is so cool but it honestly only took like 20 25 minutes me just experimenting around wow yeah so i definitely from looking at your cell tower recent video and kind of like what i saw making the show poster Mm -hmm. definitely uh like definitely 90s vhs camera style oh yes yeah, and that's that comes with the analog video gear, you know, like those textures. There's definitely a reemergence of that right now. Oh yeah, everyone is like really nostalgic. Make for the it 90s. look old. Yeah. Make it look like it's not HD. Exactly, and it's funny too because you could see that transition in the 90s where everyone was really into like that kind of gritty film texture because that's all that was really there, so that's what they were using. And then I want to say like 97, 98 more digital textures started coming in and since it was new you saw a lot of those bands want to go that route and then you know through the 2000s it was like very digital photoshop kind of textures and it's just funny it's like coming back like that like nostalgia for film right those textures there's like those music memes i think it's like band meme 666 where it's like back in the day it's like make it clean as clean and sounding as you can and then there's a, another picture where it's like nowadays it's like no send it back through this so it'll sound really distorted then send it through this it'll be lo-fi yeah i'm like it's like hilarious how now we want it to all sound messy and not very clean yeah and we just had a hell of a time recording the ep in april for linwood because we we pull from that 90s screamo sound and it kind of needs to be lo-fi and we were running everything into Ableton, actually. But we have, like I said, we have like a 48 channel board that we ran everything through. But we also had this like older mixer from like the 80s that we ran it to, and like a tape player, like a tape machine, a reel to reel. And we were just looking for this tone. And we're like, ah, whatever, we gave up, we couldn't find it, you know what I mean? And then we went, like we sent it off to get mastered. And then after mastering, it just like, I don't know, it sounded good. It sounded like we, 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 what we were looking for. Like it glued it all together. Nice. But it can get very confusing with all the routing right. when you're looking for a tone. Right. Because you're like, can, wait a minute, if you change that, then they like kind of. It, it. One little thing changes everything. You just spend two hours chasing your own tail. You right. Know? It's crazy. Awesome. Where do you find inspiration? In life. I mean, I feel like I'm in pretty like inspired person with simple things like even driving to your house today the neighborhood here is so beautiful the houses are cool i don't know nature for sure is a huge source of inspiration obviously like all of the movie stuff and the bands we talked about i'm inspired by but nature my friends i feel like all my friends are so talented right now and my girlfriend grace hall is a very talented artist and thinker too like her thoughts are just really cool and we get into some really cool conversations together that inspire me one of my best friends happy and lily are in a band ophelia and they're really good they just went on tour they inspire me a lot yeah i don't know i guess i'm like pretty down to earth when it comes to inspirations nature my friends my family gotta get back to the roots yeah man no Okay, great. So you have several music projects, Cell Tower, Linwood, and Impediment. Mm -hmm. How did each one of those start? That's a good question. So Linwood is kind of the longest running at the moment. So Linwood started technically in 2018. So Eli and I go back, like I said, we were both in drumline together, Eli and I. So we've been friends since we were like 13, 14 years old. And then we met the guitar player in Linwood Robbie in 2018 we all used to work at the Urban Juicer together and we met Robbie through the Urban Juicer realized we had similar music taste and one day we just invited Robbie over to jam and you know how it goes like we we jammed it was fun we were like okay we should start a band so back then we were called Private Idaho and did more of like a Midwesty emo thing no screaming and then did that for a little bit didn't play any shows And then I would say like 2019, we went more into like the pop punk, like 90s pop punk, like early Blink-182 style. 
like our first show we covered carousel oh yeah so yeah from blink 182 that project was called jane j-a-i-n did that for a little bit and then covid hit and you know no more shows we were just alone practicing together us three and we decided to become a screamo band instead of pop punk and then that's when we changed the name to linwood and that was yeah that was like 2020 as far as impediment i met happy around this time last year grace and i went to a show that ophelia was playing and grace was selling art and then happy and lily came up to us bought some of grace's art came fast friends i think you know that day happy was like we should play music together so i was like okay cool let's play and then like a week or two later he came over with a mutual friend of ours actually lawrence rogers and he plays bass and we just started like working on tunes and then Cornfloss, Jacob Cornfloss joined the band. You know, we've played a few shows now and it's really coming together. It sucks because all of us, all four of us in Impediment are in so many bands that it's hard to like get together. But um, when we do, it's fun. We've played a whole bunch of shows. We have one at Betty's actually, July 22nd that I'm looking forward to. So that's Impediment, that's Linwood. As far as Cell Tower, I would say that really started when I started learning how to play guitar in 2018. I started taking guitar lessons. Similar to Linwood, I went through a lot of transformations genre-wise. The name Cell Tower came kind of later on, I would say. Like, I probably came up with the name, like, late last year. So the name is pretty new, but the idea of me having a solo project and, like, writing and doing everything has been in the works for a minute. Which it's nice, you know, it's finally come together and I have stuff out, you know, the music video's out and people are liking it. And yeah, I feel like that's probably going to be my main focus moving forward is Cell Tower. Okay, cool. Yeah. Nice. It's exciting to be at the birthing. The, yeah. The genesis. Right, yeah, we'll see what happens. The alpha. It. Yeah. <laughs> not the omega. Okay, great. So you haven't left Nashville. I have not left Nashville. I have basically lived here my entire life. You know, like I grew up in Donaldson, Hermitage, Mount Juliet, Lebanon, just moving all over as a kid and then moved back to Nashville proper after high school. But I've traveled a lot. I've seen a lot of the world, but a lot of my friends are here. I'm a musician. It just makes sense to build my foundation here until I move. I see myself living somewhere else for a period of time and potentially like moving back to Nashville to settle down, start a family, stuff like that. But um, yeah, there's no real plans to leave soon. Okay, yeah. so like you would just say what has kept you here is music and art. Yeah, for sure. Music, art, I'm close to my family. All my family lives here. Got a really good friend group right now. It would just be silly to leave. <laughs> right. You know, like why leave and try to start something in New York or California that I already have here. Right. Because a lot of my friends are, you know, they got stars in their eyes and, you know, probably some of them are going to make it, honestly, because they're very talented. But, you know, they have stars in their eyes and they move to New York and they move to California for the opportunities. But I feel like there's so many opportunities here, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Dude, there's so much untapped potential here. For sure. Like, it's a little big city. I mean, for Definitely. how big it is, the music industry connects a lot of people and it's just... You can be the first here for a lot of things. For sure, yeah. yeah. And I, I don't know, like Nashville is still seen as like country music, the country music city. But well, we want people to keep thinking that. That way we right. emerge as <laughs> heroes. Or This is true. This is true. But I am excited. You know, the DIY community in Nashville has been awesome for so long. But um, I don't know. Part of me wishes that it would get more recognition, the scenes in New York and Philadelphia and stuff, because there's so much good music, especially right now, happening. But, you know, whatever. That'll come with time, I think. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. We'll pave the way, and then young bucks will come after us. Exactly. You know... Just gotta pave the road. You saying that reminded me, Linwood played a show with his band Stuntman at Two Boots, I think at the end of May. And it was a great show. We all had fun. But the kids in Stuntman are like the drummer's 11 wow. the bass player and guitar player are like 16 and they're all brothers wow. and it's super cool to see young kids out there playing shows i don't know it's really inspiring what honestly. kind of music was it um it's like stripped down punk they were a three-piece 
uh, definitely early Blink-182 vibes. I think I saw maybe some videos of that show. Yeah, yeah, very, like, the drummer just cracks me up. He's so small, but he's, like, really good. He rips. His name is Sean, too, um, which is really funny. When I met him at the show, um, after Linwood played, he came up to me and was, like, kind of gushing and being like, you're so good, blah, 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 I love your drum style, that's my favorite style. And I was like, dude, you're so good. You're 11. Like, I hadn't even started playing when I was your age. Like, you just keep at it, man. If all three of you just keep at it and, like, continue to, like, stay in Nashville and play in bands, like, it's going to be cool to watch. Right. Don't get discouraged. Yeah, seriously. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. Eventually, pass the torch. Yeah. It feels good, honestly. Yeah. You know, I was talking to Jake about this the other well, we're day. We're still really young, so it's going to be a while. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, like, in, in ways where it's like, okay, I'm 24 and he's 11. You know, right. I can I can pass on, like, advice and wisdom and stuff still. And it's like, oh, wow. It wasn't that long ago that... I was that age or I was 16, you know, and like looking for advice. Right. And it's nice to be able to actually give it. Right. You're like, if I were you back then. Right. Or like <laughs> if, yeah, like if I were you now, I would do this. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So this question might be a little hard for you to answer since you haven't left, but what have you learned living here? It is a hard question to answer because I don't have much context outside of Nashville, but the overall thing I feel like is like Nashville is very nice. A lot of people here are very genuine and down to earth. I guess like Southern hospitality plays a part in that. I don't really know, I don't know. It just seems like people have more of an idea of like basic manners and how to treat people here. Whereas like, I've never been to New York, but I have been to California and out there it seems like everyone is trying to make it and everyone has like their own thing going on. And if you um, intimidate them with your thing, they're going to treat you like an asshole or try to like, I don't know, like take advantage of you you in certain ways. Like there's always like a, uh, like a motive to people. It seems like when, I don't know, I keep saying like New York or California, but it's really like anywhere that like people will kind of try to use you for your talent or whatever. But in Nashville, there's a lot less of that, a lot more genuine people and like genuine want to like collaborate and like hang out and just be friends. Right. Yeah. With like no ulterior motives. Right. Which is really nice. I definitely noticed moving here. I moved here in 2017. Long story short, I went to college here, then I moved away, then I came back. But I've noticed here people are very genuine. Yeah. Like if you say, hey, man, let's hang out, people will take you seriously. Yeah. Back where I'm from, like people would say that kind of stuff to you all the time, but they didn't really mean it. They're yeah. just trying to be nice. And they'll say a lot of things they don't really mean, but they're just trying to be nice. Here, people will take you seriously and think you're serious when you're nice and like actually follow you up on what you said you were going to do totally it's much easier to make friends that way too exactly when you're just genuine and you're like not trying to put on airs yeah you know, like hey do you want to hang out i'm trying like i'm trying to seem like a nice person by asking you this but really i'm just gonna flake on you the day of right <laughs> right or yeah they'll say that to you to your face in person but then they weren't really serious come down the road exactly but here it's definitely like people are very what they say is usually what they mean totally which I really like that here. There's not this like southernistic kind of passive aggression where it's like, how are you? You're doing well. And they'll smile to your face and be nice to you, but it's not really nice. It's not really kind. You know, I know you feel I, good. Yeah. I know what you mean. They're yeah. doing it more for their own personal, like, at least I was, I was good to him. Right. Therefore, I you know, <laughs> had this self righteousness of. You know, I, I was nice to him. You know, he probably needed it that day. Yeah. I have myself on the back. Yeah, it's, it, I feel like it's all summed up in the the phrase, like, oh, bless your heart. Exactly. You know, because such a, what a, what a you know, backhanded thing to say, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, you're really trying, but you're just so pathetic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here, I've noticed, yeah, you have to do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. Or people will be like, oh, okay, you're just, you'll get left behind here, basically. Right. People won't take you seriously. Mm-hmm. And here, I've learned that 
your artistic merit is your biggest uh, trophy, I guess. Your your it is the it's a meritocracy here. How artistic you are, how talented you are, means way more than how much money you have or where you came from or anything like that. For sure, no one yeah. Cares about that shit. And I will say, also like the type of person and personality that you have too plays a big part in that. Because if you're talented and you know a lot of people know you and you have a lot of draw or whatever. That can be cool, and a lot of people like want to be your friend. But if you are talented and you like get a big head, it's kind of hard. Like if you don't have the personality to go with the talent, no one's gonna want to like play in your band or go on tour with you. You know, you kind of have to have both sides, like talent and the personality. You have to stay humble. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I got here, I was just like, you realize how serious and how bloodthirsty everyone is so it's like you have to rise to the occasion for sure like you're not like you you will fall to the level of your training real fast totally yeah be exposed <laughs> and you're like have to have that serious talk with yourself am i serious like all these people are so damn good mm-hmm. you know, like am i this is really what i want right and you have to answer that question pretty fast when you move here oh yeah you have to know from the get-go but it's also a, a good thing for me was like giving up on the idea of having to be the best guitar player or the best drummer, you know what I mean? And a lot of people are still caught up in that race and that's not, there's a lot of different avenues as a musician you can take. You can take the very academic route where it's like, okay, you know, I went to Nashville State and did like the jazz guitar program there and it was all about soloing with the changes and following the ch- chord progressions and stuff. And um, I got okay at it. I could get through a few standards, but there was like three or four other guitar players in the class. Very good at it, and it's natural to be competitive. And I was like, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna practice all my scales, and I'm gonna get really serious at this. And I did that for a little bit, and I was like, okay. I got better at it, but at the end of the day, I was like, this isn't why I'm, why I'm playing music. Right. I'm not gonna like go to Rudy's and like <laughs> sit in and like solo with like people. Like that's just not me. I'll go watch people do that, but like I'm more about like the artistic vision, singer songwriter thing, right? Or um, band dynamic. originality, originality and authentic, not imitation. Yeah, and it's cool because like when you're soloing, you can tap into that originality, but the I don't know the jazz academic world in music, whether it's Nashville State or Berkeley or wherever, I find very tiring and exhausting. Yeah, you out. yeah it's it's very competitive and. Everyone's trying to one-up each other. Uh, yeah. And to me, it becomes way more of a sport and less of an art. Pissing contest. Yeah, literally. Yeah, and then you go through the whole imposter syndrome. Well, I'm not as good as they are, so I must be a fraud. Yeah, why am I even playing music if I can't solo over autumn leaves? You know, it's like, you. It's, it's easy to start thinking like that when you surround yourself in a social environment that's geared towards that. Right. But on the flip side, when you surround yourself with, uh, I don't know, at least for me, like the DIY community in Nashville, those characteristics in you are brought out more. The authentic characteristics. Like instead of now, you know, I go to shows like all the time and I'm like talking to people that I admire and respect, like their musical talent and their creative energy. And then I go home and instead of like practicing a solo, I'm just like, okay, I should like go home and write a song and try to write some lyrics that are like true to my heart and stuff like that. And, um, just a much better and healthier way to be inspired. Right, don't put on a facade. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Okay, what is some advice you'd give to someone who's gonna move here and do art, art meaning music, whatever? Um, it's funny you ask that. I had a um, experience where, like a real life experience where that came into play just the other day. This new guy started at Urban Juicer and he was 20, 21, just moved here from like a very small town in Iowa population like 7,000 he was like the only musician in his town came here and was like asking me about like shows and um like he wanted to just like start a band he had a solo project and I just told him I was like man start going to shows as much as you can meet people have a good time try to make friends first don't start off networking don't start off with hey, I play in a band, or hey, I want to play in a band. Do you want to play in a band with me? I run into that pretty often, and it's like, yeah, maybe when I get to know you better, I will want to play in a band with you kind of thing. And that's what I was trying to tell um, the guy that just started Urban Juicer. It's like, 
you know don't get one itis yeah exactly and it's like i'm sure you're really excited and overwhelmed because like i said he moved from iowa population 7000 only musician there now he goes to nashville and like at the urban juicer we all play music too so it's like all of his coworkers are musicians and you know most everyone in nashville plays guitar so i was like you've definitely put yourself in a different situation and that's awesome but like I'm sure you're eager to get the ball rolling, but like make some friends first. Right. Yeah, and I would just yeah, that's the advice I would give to anyone moving to Nashville is just make some friends, be genuine. Because if you come out like right out of the gate trying to like be in bands of people and try to like social climb, most people are going to be able to see right through that, and they're not going to fuck with you. And that's kind of the way it should be, I think. Like if you are trying to use me just for my talent and not to get to know me as a person first, then like, that's kind of rude, you know, it's disrespectful. We're all artists. Most of us are very emotional. Yeah. We can pick up on that. For sure. And it's like, yeah, you don't, you can always tell who just got off the boat. For sure. And it's funny. I'll I'll go back to the guy that I was talking about one more time, but, uh, the, the kid from Iowa or whatever, he, uh, like I said, he was looking for advice. I gave him, some advice, you know, make friends first, blah, blah, blah. And um, he worked at the Urban Juice for like two weeks and then quit. I, I don't even know if he like, he may have moved back to Iowa. I'm not sure. But um, no, I hope he's doing good. It's the way it goes, man. Yeah, it really Some is. People get a lot behind. Yeah, it's true. Or they want everyone to come down to their level to help them come up. And yeah. Like, I don't know. You just got to get become secure with yourself. Yeah. And you, you know, have to like... You have setbacks and some people are going to be way better. You don't have to be intimidated. Just, you know, respect it, appreciate it. Yeah. And when I first started going to shows, um, I would just like go up to the bands afterwards and be like, hey, good set. That's it. Not like, hi, my name is Sean and I play music and I really wanted to be in a band just like, you. no, none of that. Just like, good set. And then, you know, next time I see them around, they're like, oh, hey, what's up, dude? It's like... Plant seeds. Yeah, exactly. Planting seeds. That's a great analogy. It's just like trying to make friends. And then one day those seeds will blossom and you'll start planting bands with them just because you're friends. Not because... Really not because of anything else. Just yeah. because y'all get along. Or yeah, you're a familiar face. Hey, I've seen you a couple times at the same shows I go to. Right. You must like the same music. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, and then it just happens. I mean, uh, somebody might ask you, oh, do you play an instrument? And then you're like, oh, really? My friend's looking for this kind of thing. And then there you go. Yeah, it's a very um, natural, organic way to network. Right. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's funny. My, my grandma was always like, you got to network if you want to make it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you're right, whatever. But um, I'm realizing, like, there's a way to network without having to be a businessman about it. You know right. what I mean? You can just like be yourself, make friends, and surround yourself with people who are doing a similar thing as you. Yeah. And that's just, just have, like just have fun. Yeah. Build a community. If you have fun, people want to have fun with you. Totally. Yeah. It's uh, what, is it? what am I trying to say? There's like a magnetism towards that attitude. Definitely. Yeah. You are what you attract. So exactly. Make sure you're having fun. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Here's another question for you. What is your biggest personal growth from last year to this year? That's an excellent question. From last year to this year, I made a lot of friends within like last year to this year. I feel like I've become much more social. I feel like a lot of people can relate with that just because like 2020 and most of 2021, we were very isolated, um, only talking to close friends and family. And then you come out and we're all like so socially pent up that it's kind of an explosion of social energy. And I definitely experienced that, you know, first going to shows last year, like the summer when they first started happening again. I would say personally, just like what I've grown most in is just like conversation, you know, just like learning how to let other people speak, giving people space, trying to listen more, honestly because I'm a rambler and I will go on and on and kind of forget that the other person's there. <laughs> so I've been trying to hone in my listening skill, Nice. you know? Yeah, it's good. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's paid off. Like I said, like I've made a lot of friends and I feel like, I don't know, I'm like genuinely interested in people too. So I, when I meet a new person, like I want to listen, I'm eager to hear about them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. Take yourself out of it. Yeah, it's nice, too. It's so much easier that way. <laughs> yeah, it is. Because then you don't have to worry about, did they like me? Did I say something stupid? Right. If 
you're not worried about yourself and only worry about them, then those thoughts won't cross your mind. Totally. Okay, cool. What are some of your favorite YouTube videos? Man, I'm like super into video essays right now. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> Rafe is telling me about yeah, that. Yeah, dude. Like, what the hell are video essays? Video essays are sick. Um, there's a video essay for any cultural topic. Obviously, I'm super into like the music and um, film video essays. But Grace and I will watch like pop culture video essays on like the Met Gala or whatever. And those are cool too. I love those. But um, I'd say like a YouTube channel that I go to frequently is Trash Theory. It's a music video essay um, YouTube channel. Really good. They just released one about Bjork, which was cool. And Bjork is a funny thing. Like I don't really like her music, but I love hearing her talk about music. Hmm. Like her like approach her approach is really fascinating to me another video essay channel um is called cinema cartography and it's just like about the history of film and they're doing a really cool thing right now where they're trying to teach like early film like how it came into inception so i think the last video essay they just released was about like edison and like the very first movies and like there was like this um don't know what to call it. Edison, basic, not Edison. I'm thinking of someone else. Fuck. Anyways, it doesn't matter. But there was a uh, Thomas Jefferson. No. Ben no, Franklin. No. Who was the guy that was super into DC Current? Was that it? DC Current. Yeah, like you know, there's like AC Current and DC Current. Oh, Tesla. No. He like had a lot of the very first patents. He was kind of an asshole. Wasn't Edison? Wasn't Ben Franklin? Maybe, maybe it was Edison. I don't know, but. The, the main point is like the cinema cartography, great film video essay YouTube channel, and they just released one about like the early days of film, and I don't know, I find that stuff super interesting. What exactly is a video essay? So a video essay is like a normal essay, but in video format. So like there'll be like an introduction, and then usually it's about one thing. So... You know, like the Trash theory, theory music video essay was a, that I just watched about Bjork was like her whole life. So we started at the very beginning, talked about like facts of her childhood, where she grew up, blah, 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 her rise to fame, kind of just like followed her life, gave factual information about it. Usually the presentation is really specific and important. The visuals they'll use, um, transitions, stuff like that. Like it's very much of a style thing um, in each youtube channel has like their own style okay which is really cool and they're like what 20 30 minutes long yeah yeah 20 30 minutes um some of them can be like an hour two hours depending and it's um, just someone talking the whole just time. someone talking and they'll have like clips of like i don't know like the example with bjork they'll have like clips of her from her childhood and he'll be like talking over stuff like that okay yeah cool now that I've heard it from both of y'all, I'll have to check these out. Check it out, dude. I'm obsessed. It's how I uh, learn about a lot of stuff, honestly, is okay. the video essay format. Okay, because I'm obsessed with... I love watching interviews. I love Same. shitload of interviews. Yeah, anybody I'm into, that's like the first thing I'll do. It's just yeah. like, I uh, hit a big like talking heads phase, and right, I've David seen Byrne. everything of David Byrne. Any David Byrne interview I've watched. Um, same with Billy Corgan, Smashing Pumpkins. Oh, yeah. Patty Smith. Yeah, there's I could just keep going. I love interviews. Yeah. Yeah. David I've seen David Byrne twice. Really? Where at? The Ryman once at Bonnaroo. That's sick. What year at Bonnaroo? Uh, what was that? Two thousand fourteen? Okay. That was the that was a good year. Is that the year that Jack White played? Yeah. Cool. I was so there. I saw him too. That must have been so sick. I wanted to go that year. And Kanye. Yeah, and then that was the last time, right? Because he, yeah. like, said some shit on stage. I well, no, that. that was 2008 when he said some... Well, he stormed off 2008, okay. but he came back in 2014. Right, he was, like, talking shit. And he was hilarious. He yeah. was like, why the fuck did they got fuck Kanye on the porta potties? Oh, my God. Going off. Bonnaroo... It was a great show. Bonnaroo was great when it was great. Like, I went 2015 15 through 2017... And, I don't know, the last year I went, the lineup wasn't that great. It became very much about EDM oh. and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And it's like, man, there was a time period when, like... Special bands. Radiohead played, you know, Jack White. Oh, I yeah. saw Radiohead. And that was, like, a 
very like um, historical performance too. That was like, yeah. Well, I don't know if the 2012 one is the one I'm thinking of, but it might have been like 2007 or eight. It was like right before or after In Rainbows came out. In they Rainbows played, came out 2007. Did it? Okay. So probably. They they played around like that time at Bonnaroo and played a lot of the songs off that album for the first time live at Bonnaroo. Oh yeah, I remember when they played Reckoner and then all of a sudden these fireworks started going off. I took some acid, so I was like aware of everything. Yeah. Was That's awesome. Great time. <laughs> yeah, the first time I took acid was at Bonnaroo in 2015. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, yeah, I saw um, Mac DeMarco nice. and then saw um, Alabama Shakes and Kendrick Lamar on acid at Bonnaroo. It was wow. great. I just like, actually, I sat on top of a trash can for like two hours, <laughs> just like by myself. You know, I went with a group, classic Bonnaroo story. Right. Went with a group. We all took acid and I lost everyone. Right. And I was like, I'll just sit on this trash can. It's fine. <laughs> right. You kind of go on your own little journey. Yeah. Well, I'll see you back at campsite. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Man. Awesome. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to add that I might not have asked for? No, I don't think so. Um, you asked a lot of really good questions. We covered really all of my interests. Um, no, there isn't. Okay, great. Here's the last question. What is something absurd you'll ever do? Absurd? Ooh. I'm uh, kind of like a mystic person. I'm really into like ancient Egyptian mythology, hermeticism. And there's Eye of Horus. Yeah, yeah. So I have the Eye of Horus tattooed. I have the Philosopher's Stone and like the Mercury symbol tattooed as well. Wow. So I'm really into like symbols and um, manipulating symbols for like personal growth. Sacred geometry. Sacred geometry, Jungian psychology, archetypes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta show you my little library. Okay, hell yeah. So I'm actually reading um, Psychology and Alchemy by Carl Jung right now. Really good, really dense, but yeah, so much information. I love it. So yeah, I utilize a lot of that in my life. I like meditate on symbols. Have and, you um, gone the whole Aleister Crowley route? Oh, for sure. When I was younger, like when I was like Book of Foth. Yeah, like when I like just graduated high school, I was taking a lot of psychedelics and getting into a lot of like occulted chemical stuff, right. and definitely crossed his path wicked man on earth yeah right there's a lot of like negative stuff about him i don't have too much of opinion uh i'm trying to think there's that one like his um religion or what whatever like thelm like thelma. Thelema. thelema right yeah and there's like what's that do as thou wilt yes it do as thou wilt and then there's like a it's second the whole of the law yeah and then there's like a another part of it that a lot of people leave off it's like do as thou wilt is the whole of the law and the law is love Really? Yes. I'm yeah. almost positive that's the whole phrase, but a lot of people will cut off that last part to... Because that's like the most hedonistic thing. It's a very hedonistic thing because it's like, do whatever you want. Yeah. And that's including the horrible things you could do. Yeah. But when the law is love, it kind of puts it more into context. And I think, I don't know, a lot of maybe like dissenters around Aleister Crowley, a lot of people who are trying to like bring him down probably had an agenda. And kind of were like, do as thou wilt. He's trying to be hedonist, blah, blah, blah. Well, he was. He, he died alone and very depressed. Did he? See, I, I know a little bit, but at the same time, there was so much controversy and so much confusion around it. I was kind of like, I'm going to step back from this guy. He lost all his money, lost all his friends, lost oh all gosh. his wives, his children, basically were dead. Well, geez, well, that's kind of... Yeah, he, I mean, <laughs> I, I've also read a lot about Al Crowley, and he was... They call him the wickedest man because he was just like, do as thou wilt was the whole of the law for him. So he yeah. was chasing sex, pleasure, blood sugar, sex, magic, whatever. Right. And most everyone he dealt with turned insane. See, that's a horrible way to live life because the things that he was into have validity, but the way he was using it in that hedonistic way is, um, I don't know, he got what was coming to him, I suppose, right? Like it's right. very karmic that way. Like if you do that, you will lose all the people around you and you will die alone. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I think he died a, a Christian on his deathbed. Interesting. Might have, might have, or no, I don't think he died a Christian. I think he died saying, I might be wrong about all of this. Oh, wow. And uh, I think that's like some like notorious story about him. That kind of contextualizes everything. Kind of being, because like, I mean, one of his wives 
their child died of typhoid and he like put it on her and she killed herself it's like he he was like yeah this was your fault oh my died. gosh yeah. and she like ended up killing herself and like a lot of that's and, intense that's sad and he, there was this like one dude who was like gay lover for him mm-hmm. and he like took advantage of him and made him go insane because he like used him as a conduit for which he would pull demons out oh my god so he would put him in the circle in the desert and then like do these spells and the guy ended up going insane that's crazy yeah. oh my gosh so it's a lot of that like, uh-huh. everyone he comes across usually ends up going insane it's funny I, I think back to the Spider-Man quote from Uncle Ben um, <laughs> with great responsibility uh, with great power comes great. comes great responsibility and I think it's that way when you start getting into um, deep metaphysical things like um, alchemy cultism all of that because I don't know how much you can change the world with it you can change yourself using those symbols Mm -hmm. in your personality and um, you can do a lot of like self work that's kind of the way Carl Jung looks at it shadow work right shadow work and he was a part of like the whole developing the theories of the conscious unconscious subconscious with Freud but departed with Freud kind of like early on in his career where Freud went down the kind of sexual rabbit hole Jung went more into like a religious spirituality under almost like a theological understanding with psychology as the backbone and uh yeah I don't know I feel like I'm learning a lot about how to uh grow yeah yeah by reading the book psychology and alchemy by Carl Jung and using those symbols and meditating on them come in terms with your anima exactly yeah there you go your higher self yeah yeah your female version of yourself is that what that is the feminine energy. yeah 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 and in female it's the animus which yes is the masculine energy you're right because like when we are born or whatever we start off as female then we become men we become male mm-hmm. and so like there's always a feminine version inside yourself as well as a masculine version inside a female self. Mm-hmm. And you have to develop both. Exactly. Yeah, if not, yeah, you'll become super unbalanced. And uh, I feel like simple things like that, just like conceptualizing that idea of, okay, there is a feminine and a male energy within me, like having that idea and trying to balance them, like you're already on the right path. Right. If you have that conception, right. right, and you're like working towards that, you're already doing like really well, but a lot of people don't even have that conception. And, uh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely not a perfectly balanced human by any means, but, uh, yeah, I just, I wish this knowledge was kind of more commonplace. Right. Some people, some men might be like, that's kind of a feminine thing to do. And some women might be like, that's too masculine. Right. But it's like, you're kind of two parts of the same whole. For sure. And then if you, develop like both parts yeah. you can superhuman literally yeah right and like you can relate with people more exactly. and you can like you know talk yeah, to empathy. an opposite sex or like you know whatever um and be more empathetic be more empathetic and not every conversation you have with the opposite sex is seen in the light of flirting or whatever right. you know and that's that's been really liberating for me that's a hard thing to get through. it is and it's hard when you can kind of see it in the other person too you're like, like oh like, he's hitting he might be hitting on me right oh no i'm tr- trying not as hard as i can be as platonic as possible right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 great to find balanced people with that energy nice. you know well sean we've covered a lot of ground we have thank you for being on here and coming over thanks for inviting me over I had a good time yeah